Welcome back to The Craft, where we explore what we're learning about the creative process. I'm Carter, a PhD candidate at the University of Kentucky and a writer. And I'm Colby. I'm a music producer and product manager. And today, we're going to be talking about strategy. What is strategy? How do you implement it? Is there bad strategy? Is there good strategy? How do we distinguish between those? Colby's going to kick us off here with kind of an introduction to the topic, and then we'll just go from there. Yeah, I'm excited, man. I I have been waiting to talk to someone about this for a few weeks now. And so I read this book called Good Strategy, Bad Strategy. I'm in like, I'm 90% of the way through it. And it really is because I was thinking about this for my work in product management over the past month or two. But it's kind of this question in my head, like, what is strategy? You know, like we hear this word thrown around all the time. You know, that's a really strategic idea. We need a strategic plan. Just put the word strategic in front of whatever. And it sounds like smarter, businessy. It's it's like almost like saying this word manifests something, you know, but what does it really mean? Like, I just didn't really know. And I wanted to think about it, read about it and learn like, wh- how do you actually make a strategy? So it came out of like a business perspective, but then as I thought about it more, I'm like, how does this apply to creativity, to my personal life, to other areas? Because at the end of the day, I think what I'm seeing is that strategizing is just a form of problem solving, really. And so I read this book and it's been really, really helpful for me in understanding the basics of strategy. So it's called Good Strategy, Bad Strategy by Richard Rummel. And I'm just going to break down like the the ideas for you, Carter, and then we can kind of go from there. But I think the high level idea of the book is that bad strategy is the default. (laughs) Bad strategy is everywhere and good strategy is what's rare and what's surprising to people. So he opens the book with this really interesting story about how back in the 90s, Steve Jobs came back to Apple and the company was very close to crashing and and dying out, but he turned the company around despite how dire the circumstances were, but he didn't do any of the things that these magazines, like Wired Magazine at the time posted this article and said, you know, here's all the recommendations of what you should do. You should do a merger with this company. You should get acquired by that company. You should do all these other things. Everyone had their opinion on what Apple should do. Steve Jobs came in and he just did what surprised everyone. And basically what Richard says is like, he he basically just did business 101 things. He helped the company mercilessly cut expenses so that it would survive longer. And then he reduced the product lines because they had all these products, like they were making these, they're called peripherals. Like, I don't, I don't know, like keyboards, all these different other non-computer things that just plug into a computer. He like, I think maybe even like radios and like other things that were just not their bread and butter. Cut all these products. He cut all these manufacturing people out. He cut out all these expenses and they also had like 15 versions of the Mac. He cut it down to one version. So he was just focusing and simplifying everything down to the lifeline of the company to make sure that they would have a longer runway and survive longer. And then they could focus on what's next, but they had to just survive. They also launched a web store. They uh, cut back on the number of retailers from like five retailers to one retailer nationwide. And they made all these decisions, but they were all tied into the strategy of survive basically. And so that's how he starts the book off. And he says, what surprised people about this is that's a good strategy. Why is it a good strategy? Because they survived, I mean, ultimately. And so that's kind of the core core story that kicks the book off. And from there he goes to just provide some really simple definitions. So I want to share those with you real quick. We have the way he defines bad strategy is a failure to face the actual problem that you're working through. It's whenever someone, or it's when someone just says a bunch of fluff. Our strategy is keyword, buzzword keyword. Uh, It's whenever uh, you're just setting goals. Like our strategy for 2023 is we want to make 20% profit margins. We want to grow 20%. We want to save 20% more money. Those are just goals. Those are not a strategy. And then the fourth, he says, bad strategy is just setting these objectives that are impossible to achieve. They're not realistic. So what's good strategy? Good strategy at the core, he says, there's like a kernel to good strategy or a central part of it, like a seed. There's 
a diagnosis of what is the real problem, a guiding policy, which is like, how are we going to solve this problem? Just general guardrails, not specific things, but general guardrails and how we make decisions. For example, it could be, we're only going to serve this type of customer or we're only working in this demographic or sorry, this um, geographic area. And then a coherent action plan. Those are like the two or three big steps that I'm going to take to overcome this problem that we've identified. So it's just coherent, a diagnosis, guiding policy, coherent action. And so that was a really helpful definition for me because it was so straightforward. And then I think the big question is, how do you apply that to your creative life, your side business, whatever it is that you're thinking about as you listen to this? So that was that's my monologue. That's my TED Talk. What do you think about that, dude? Yeah, that's really interesting. So bad strategy relying on these abstractions, these just kind of wish list ideas. This is what we want to do. Good strategy, right? Having some sort of concreteness to it, some directions some protocols. It sounds like some guidelines. I'd be interested in how do you think, how do you think that applies? And maybe this is just for me to the Steve job example. Like it seems like what is he doing there that makes it good strategy? And then I would just like to hear maybe that again. But then also, like, is there some sort of value that has to guide good strategy versus bad strategy? Like, is there any sort of, like, difference in values, I wonder? So, like, could you have a bad strategy with good values? Or or could you have, I guess, a good strategy with bad values? Like, is it totally independent of ends? Like, does strategy just talk about the means is kind of a question for... You know what I mean? Philosophical. Well, yeah. yeah, I just, I think oftentimes we talk about it, right? It's like strategy is how you get stuff done. Like we have a goal. Mm-hmm. We've got to do something to get to the goal. Like that's where strategy comes in. And so I wonder like what the relationship needs to be between goals and strategy. But maybe let, let's table that. I'd sure. love to just hear more about, okay, what specifically, and you mentioned a lot of things that Jobs did, but what makes that... I don't know, what makes that good strategy? Maybe just return for that for a second, because I think there's some richness in that example. Well, I think if you want to hear a better take on this, you should definitely listen to a talk from Richard Rumo. You can look it up on YouTube. Just search Richard Rumo, good, bad, good, bad strategy. You'll find the talk he did in like a lecture hall that walks through this story. But I'll give my summary here. I think that the main things I just shared with you are essentially like the coherent action steps. Like he shut down, he went down from five to one retailers. He got a deal with uh, Microsoft for $150 million. I forgot to mention that one. That's pretty big. He, and that tied into the fact that there was some antitrust stuff happening with Microsoft at the time. He shut down like 15 versions of the Mac and took it down to one version. So simplified and started a web store to go direct, sell directly to customers. And he also, you know, cut a lot of, team members and a lot of expenses and I think maybe even moved manufacturing. He essentially, those are just the action steps. So we need to go back up to what's the guiding policy and what's the diagnosis. So the guiding policy, I think from the outside looking in is that Apple needs to focus on doing the one thing right and getting back to the root, which is having beautiful products and really they, they, they revolutionize like the personal computer. And so going back to that personal computer, cutting off all those other products, that's like, seems to be the guiding policy is, let's actually go back to the top. Sorry, I'm going to pause this. Go to the diagnosis. I think that the diagnosis is, hey, they have a few months and then they're going to run out of money and be bankrupt. So that the diagnosis is then, okay, why are we in this position? What do we need to change to get out of this position? And I think that, the way that he diagnosed that problem was like, we don't have time to be thinking about all of these other R and D programs and all these other things. The, the diagnosis is we need to survive because we've lost our way. We've lost our focus. So it seems like the, the word focus would be the diagnosis of the problem because all of his decisions are simplification of the chaos, you know, reducing the number of distributors, reducing the number of products, reducing the number of team members and reducing the costs and expenses. 
So I think that the diagnosis of focus led to the guiding policy being something around we need to focus and simplify and survive, basically, which led to the to the action steps that all they're all moving in the same direction, basically. They're coordinated. They're not, you know, one team's doing this, this other idea is doing this. It all works together to basically at that time give Apple the cash that it needs to survive so that it could go on to build, you know, the iPod, the iPhone, the iPad. Yeah, that makes sense. So two things that I, th- I think are emerging. One is that good strategy takes kind of an honest evaluation of where you're at. And so I, I think that could yes. that could be really helpful in thinking about the creative process too. Of maybe the first step, like you said before, is is finding the actual problem. And oftentimes, I guess that requires a lot of honesty, right? If something's not working, I think our tendency is to try to hold on to it for all sorts of different reasons. But sometimes it's like you got to bring the axe to it. <laughs> I mean, that's what it, that's what the job story seems to to be about. Is like this isn't working. So let's not just bleed out here, like let's just cauterize this thing and be done, right? And so I, I think that maybe begins with an honesty. And so mm-hmm. I think that might be something that we can talk about within that. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think the that's one of the things that really stuck out to me was him saying bad strategy often just says, hey, you know, our, our goal this year is to just like be customer oriented or maybe put in the creative world. My goal is to be the best music producer and to make them, you know, just the most successful songs and just these kind of generalities, this fluff. The oftentimes what's missing is I want to be a better music producer. The problem is I'm not very good at music theory. Okay, well then what do I need to do? I need to go, I don't need to go just do the same things over and over again. I need to deliberately practice music theory so that I get better at that hone in on that weak spot like there has to be a a clear acknowledgement of the problem if you're going to actually address it i think that was like one of the biggest you know light bulbs in the book for me yeah that makes total sense yeah i mean that's kind of requires a degree of self-consciousness of kind of self-recognition of of not allowing what things ought to be like or should be like, or you hope that things are with the current situation and having kind of a more even appraisal of it, uh, which I think can be hard creatively sometimes, right? I mean, I guess mm-hmm. within the the business place, yes, there are many more factors in a successful business than bottom line, but the bottom line does have a, you know, a pretty powerful, clear indication of how a strategy is working. And so I definitely don't want to say that, right, the only strategy or the only goal of a company is to make money. I think that's what's ended us up in a lot of trouble uh, with how our current economy is structured. But at the same time, you get feedback pretty directly. Like if you're, for the example of Apple, like if you're not selling whatever that periphera is, then, right, you're losing money. You can clearly see that. And so Jobs, you know, was able to come in and say, hey, look, this is clearly... And it might have helped him coming from outside. I mean, is he returning at this time from Pixar? I am not. I think so. He's definitely returning from being, you know, out. Ousted, okay. I, I don't know. Ousted maybe is the right word. I'm yeah, not sure I think it, it is. is. Kind of being pushed out of the company for several years at least. And so, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that might have helped him coming back in to identify that. But my main point is that creatively that can kind of be hard. Like finding what, yeah. um, let, let's think about this specifically, like finding what the problem is with a track that you're working on. I mean, th- th- that's that's more difficult than we're losing money. <laughs> you know, yes, there's a lot of factors in what makes a company profitable, but at least you can have a metric. But when we move to the creative world, I think sometimes those metrics are more difficult to determined. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cause it's not just, I mean, unless you're looking at something like, you know, I want to get more followers or I want to make more money or increase the retention of my videos or whatever, unless it's that type of quantitative thing, then yeah, it's, it's like, how do you measure? I want to be a better producer. Is it measured by who you get to work with or by how much you can charge or by just like, having the respect of someone that you respect and them saying, saying something about you, or is it just a internal uh, scorecard? Like I, 
I know I can do this now. And so I feel like I've hit that goal myself. It's very vague. Yeah. And I really, I think this is, I think some thoughts are starting to coalesce here with the original idea of until we can find, I think, a direction to go, it's kind of hard to get strategy worked up. I think this is what I was trying okay. to get at with ends and means. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So I so the this kind of deserves the bigger episode or a different episode maybe because I think a helpful framework I've seen for what you're describing is that, and this comes from uh, in the a product world example uh, from Lenny, Lenny's newsletter dot com. But he talks about like the core documents or the core sort of ideas that you need to have for like a company, right? So there's like a mission and vision, which some people separate those, some people keep them the same. And that's like, where do we want to go in the future? And what kind of world do we want to live in? And then there's, okay, but we're here today. So then you have the next level down from that zooming in a little more is what's your strategy? How do we get from where we are today to this world we want to be in one day in the future? And then you have goals somewhere in there as well, maybe below strategy that are saying, okay, in order to, you know, we need to achieve these different numbers. And then you have below the goals, you have like a roadmap. This quarter, we're working on this stuff. Next quarter, we're working on these other two or three items. And then that helps us move, move forward, take the next steps. And then from the roadmap, you might have, what am I doing this week? And so there's like all those different levels that all ladder up to a big picture vision. And I feel like that's kind of what you're describing. So I just wanted to share that as an aside because I feel like this, we're talking about strategy, which fits into this like bigger umbrella of ideas, you know? Yeah, I think I, that's super helpful. And, you know, here's kind of me coming into this with maybe a hot take. Um, it seems like, it seems like in the artistic world, we have, an easier time thinking about those visions, the um, mission, right? We, we think about um, writing a beautiful novel. We think about moving people with a song. But we tend to spend less attention with the, quote, nitty-gritty of strategy, right? It seems like the emphasis is, okay, we have a vision for what we want to do, but oftentimes it can be difficult to try to get the strategy in place. And that, I think, is quite different than the business world. I think, overarchingly, the market is much more comfortable in focusing on strategy and spends less time thinking about the vision and mission because we're really good at practicality, right? We're really good at, like, getting the instruments to work. Like, I want to get to 100,000 followers. I can find tons of research about how to get there, what I can't find a ton of research about is why I should bother getting 100,000 followers, right? The goal is assumed, and then the strategy is described with minutia. And so to me, I feel like there is kind of a difference here of like the strategy seems much more abstract in artistic pursuits, but the goals seem defined. But then in kind of more business-oriented pursuits, sometimes the goals are just assumed and the strategy is defined with minutia. I don't know. What do you think about that kind of dichotomy I'm painting there? Okay, I want to make sure I understand it. So in like a business context, and you're maybe saying like trying to grow my YouTube channel to make money is like an example of like a creative business. It's like, okay, the goal is assumed. You want to have a lot of people following you. Obviously, that's a good thing. That's, in, that's the assumption. And then from that, you say, okay, the strategy is how do you go from 1 to 1,000, 1,000 to 100,000? Yeah, so I think within within that framework, I think that he has, the assumption sometimes is not interrogated in the business world, right? So we, yeah. we don't spend, here's another way to say this, I don't think we spend as much time thinking about what the end goals ought to be in a business setting because we yeah. assume that it's to make money, but we do spend a lot of time thinking about the end goals in artistic settings, but this is kind of like an imbalance because I think in the artistic setting, we don't spend enough time talking about strategy, right? We don't actually spend enough time talking about the practicality to get yeah. there. But in business, we spend a lot of time talking about that. We don't spend as much time talking about the ends. In the creative side, it's more, that was the one that was confusing me more. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. it's like, there's a lot of talk around, 
why art matters and what the purpose of, yes, of developing exactly. your voice and your taste and totally. you do it for the craft. Like that's what this podcast is about. You know, it's not about the money. It's about like just making something that makes someone cry because it's so beautiful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like you talk all day about the vision and the the impact and this high level stuff and then cool, but how do I do that? How do I go from here to the next step to the next step and get better or actually make those things reasonable. It can be a lot of pie in the sky yes. kind of talk Boom. maybe. I think that's exactly right. And I think part of our inclination with the craft, when we say creative process, like we want to press into the process part of it because mm-hmm. that's where there's kind of, right, that's where there's a gap. I think that's totally, I think that's, that's you articulated that perfectly. And so on the other side, I think things are just inversed. Yeah. So if we're talking about like, in, you know, a business, we are really attuned. Okay, I need my SEO correct. I need, you know, these are the ads. This is the ROI on the ads. This is the brand deals. This is how much I can get. This is how I can leverage this, right? There's no shortage of discussions about how to build Mm -hmm. your YouTube following. Tons of content on that. But there's not as much discussion about what following should you pursue (laughs) or or what's going to be the best kind of creative goals for the business. And so I don't know, it just seems Mm -hmm. like in both cases, both are there. Just the emphasis lies on strategy, I think in more business settings, and it lies on goals or visions in artistic settings. So I don't know, that's just an inclination that I have. That's very interesting. And I'm sure it's more of a, sure there's, it's not always like that, but it does seem like maybe a caricature, like almost like a bit of a stereotype perhaps but a general principle that might be true to it, you know? Well, I think we love it when they come together, right? We love it when, like, Patagonia has a clear vision and a strategy. Like, that's so, right, like, right. that's great. That It's so satisfying, especially when the vision is really healthy. Uh, and then we love artists, artists that have a clear vision but are also really, really good at what they do. Like, it's like we want to bring both of those together, and I think that's perhaps where... Like the discussion of strategy is so important because it's not like you can just have one or the other. Yeah, that's well said. So, I mean, for you, what's really missing in that space between? Can you get maybe pers- do you have any examples? I guess of what is in that space between? I know that my vision as an artist is to make this art to speak for someone who don't, someone who doesn't have a voice. That could yeah, be political, yeah. social, or it could be. I know that my call is to make this art to just reach people who are struggling with these issues, mental health, emotional, spiritual, or it could, you know, like we have these kind of clear like paths that are talked about, but then what's missing? Is it a like development plan that's missing? Like the strategy of how to get better as an artist, or is it like how to find where you fit in? Yeah. I don't know. What yeah. What do you think is an, a practical example of that? Can I give a broad answer than a precise yeah, sure, answer? Sure. <laughs> okay. My broad answer, our, our idea here, is that it has something to do with the mystery of art itself. So why does one song resonate with people and another one doesn't? I mean, I don't think there's any way that you can just kind of quantify that. I mean, certain yes, there's kind of aesthetic properties we can talk about, but some things just last and they resonate and people are drawn to them. It's like, why the Beatles and not another innovative band in that time period, right? There's some of these questions and, you know, what makes something speak? Why is one sentence moving me and another sentence is not? Some of that, I think, is just ineffable. And so I think it's a struggle to say, well, it's not a checklist. Like, I can't just sit down with a checklist. Checklists help, but it's not like paint the numbers. <laughs> it's not painting by the numbers. Like it's not just do this, do this, and then you'll be saved. <laughs> like it it's not that. So I think that kind of makes it a point of resistance for artists of you're 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 not even quite sure. I mean the great artists are not even quite sure how it happens. <laughs> so you're just talking about your art making an impact in someone and being yes. received well by your audience. Well, that vision, so accomplishing that vision to write a beautiful novel. Oftentimes, mm-hmm. novelists won't know how they do that. I mean, yeah, you, what does that mean? There is no fill in the blank template because it's correct. not a template. It's a, you're making a new piece of art. 
Yeah, I mean, people talk about how it's like almost dictated to them, the novel, right? We've talked about this on the show before. So it's like this, it's this thing where they're not like, yeah, there's no template for this. I don't even understand how completely I'm writing this. <laughs> and so I think that makes strategy hard, first of all. And then the personal kind of answer of this is for me, strategy is difficult because it's really, really taxing and kind of boring, right? I mean, this kind of gets into our episode about practice, I feel like. I mean, strategy is not nearly as fun as <laughs> as thinking about like the product or the end of this or the completed poem, like the, the actual part of it, the uncomfortable memorization and practice and frustration of getting it wrong, like the the things that strategy requires of us, for me, right, that's not that's not as inspiring in itself as this idea of what I'm moving towards, right? Because we have a goal and we want to achieve the goal. Um, but getting to that goal can seem a lot less exciting. Um, and, and so I think part of the reasons why strategy gets undervalued maybe in artistic pursuits is that one, it can be kind of ineffable what exactly, what strategy is going to lead to a great work of art. I mean, it's kind of a, a tough question. But two, strategy is often the mundane. It's often the kind of daily slow sharpening that happens that's hard to see direct results. So th- that's kind of my personal experience with it of, of kind of maybe why strategy is less defined in, in what I'm working on. I mean, I think we spend a lot of time thinking about how we can develop strategies. If you say you want to do a beat a day, you're going to make a beat every day, that, that could be a really good strategy mm-hmm. to become a better musician. Mm-hmm. But the actual doing a beat a day is kind of a drag. <laughs> So like, it's yeah, oh you're saying yeah taking action on the strategy yes, is the yeah. part that's hard oh for sure yeah that's so, definitely can't yeah you definitely true I think we spend less time concerned about strategy because it's not super pleasant to actually do yeah no and that's that's like what he says in the book man it's like people would rather just be like we've got these goals we've got this vision it's gonna be awesome than say like okay cool. We, but you, so yeah, the thing is you yeah. need that and I'm not really good at that. And so that's, that's my side where I'm working on is zooming out and seeing the big picture sometimes, but you need that, but then you need to do, uh, there's actually a quote that I'll share real quick. That's perfect for this. He says, strategy is visible as coordinated action imposed on a system. When I say strategy is imposed I mean just that. It is an exercise in centralized power used to overcome the natural workings of a system. This coordination is unnatural in the sense that it would not occur. It's pretty academic sounding, but essentially a strategy is something that will not happen accidentally. Like you are saying, okay, I'm going to mold the way that I I spend my time. I'm going to mold the way that we spend money. I'm going to mold the way that we choose what projects I choose to work on in a coordinated way so that the resources are directed towards the same goal we're all headed north you know it's not i'm spending some time over here doing this yeah reading about that it's you know all disconnected it has to be so of course it's uncomfortable and difficult because it's it is actually by definition unnatural (laughs) dude i love that i mean the the first example that springs to my mind is like learning an instrument right you you can't just like sit down and I don't know, just spend time with a guitar and bring it all over the house and travel with it and learn it. Like it's not an acquisition by proximity. It's like it, no, it it, is. <laughs> it's an imposition to get your fingers to do what they need to do. It's so uncomfortable. Exactly. It is it's truly yeah. unnatural, but then it leads to this really beautiful thing. So that it's very odd. So yeah, not sorry I misunderstood your point there, but I do no, think that's that good. It, that's helpful. It makes a lot of sense that Yeah, the actual taking action of the strategy. It's honestly easier to sit and think about it and come up with cool ideas and, you know, but it really does, at the end of the day, like once you get down from, you you diagnose the problem, you have some guiding policies and then you get to the coherent action, you have to do the hard work. But something positive I'll share on that note is this idea of approximate objective. So approximate objective is something that, you can achieve in a reasonable amount of time and it's not 
too, it's this like kind of Goldilocks, you know, not too hot, not too cold, but just right. So it's setting goals for yourself where you can get motivated because you know it's achievable this year, in six months, in three months, in three weeks, maybe. But it's not so small that it's like not really a goal. It's just something you're going to do today, you know? So it has to inspire you as well. And so a good example of this is in the, uh, is it the 60s, Kennedy said that we're going to go to the moon. And it was actually a very strategic goal that they knew they could achieve within 10 years. They had a plan of building bigger rockets and doing two or three things, making a rocket that could land and actually go back to earth. Like there were two or three big things they needed to do. But the reason they chose that goal was because they believed they could do it within the 10 years. So it was a stretch goal in, in the sense that it was a bigger picture thing, but they believed that they could do it. And there was not just like, hey, we're going to go to Mars one day, you know, which at that time, and even now, I don't know. But anyways, so that's been helpful for me to think about just setting that realistic next step in the strategy. It doesn't have to be, okay, in 10 years, I want to be there. It could be as simple as, here's my my plan for the next three months. Yeah, that makes absolute sense. I think, I think uh, you know, translating this onto creative pursuits is one, really helpful, and two, kind of difficult because there are oftentimes right. less quantitative like metrics that we can use. Yeah, we can say, hey, I want 100 followers by next year on this Substack or something. But, you know, that's something that you can say, okay, here's a goal. This is where I need to be. I need By March, I need to be doing, you know, around here. And I can kind of track it and I can set where I want to be throughout the year. But when you start getting to, I don't know, just I want to write better sentences. I mean, it's just, it's kind of difficult. Does it apply at that level, I don't know. Because I, my inclination is, is that it does, right? But it, it, I think it's just, I don't know. It seems to me less trackable. So actually, I, w- I would press into that too because I think the the actual part of strategy that I think is the most meaningful and the hardest is, okay, yeah, you diagnose a problem. You could do that wrong, first of all. You could diagnose a problem. It's a problem, but is it... Strategy is diagnosing the problem, the one or two critical things that if you change it, if you are yeah, able to overcome yeah. that problem, then the good stuff happens and that's where you want, you know? So it's not just like, oh yeah, we've got to, like, we all have problems and we all have a lot of problems, but it's defining, okay, no, that problem's unimportant. Actually, that's not really holding me back. Oh, that's not an issue. It's this thing right here. And it's some people call it like having like an insight, you know, or like a, yeah. a critical insight. You Ooh. can't just sit there and be like, all right, I want to have an insight. What's holding me back as an artist? Okay, um, it's that. You know, yeah. it's a probably a combination of thinking really hard about the problem, thinking about what's holding you back, taking walks, and maybe even just being hit by, you know, ideas coming together a month later. It, it feels like there isn't necessarily like a checklist of how to have an insight. Yeah. Dude, that makes total sense. And it's like, if I apply that to what I just said, I want to write a better, I want to write better sentences. Like that's a bad diagnosis, I think, because it's not specific enough. Right. And so I do think we get into places artistically that we do have to deal with kind of broad visions, but that would be a bad goal. Now, if I, I don't know, a better kind of diagnosis would be, you know, I want to be, I don't know, I, I, I want to have a better cadence in my sentence structures, Right, and then I can start kind of reading other authors, noticing what they're doing, and I can start to work on something a little more precise. And so right. I really, I, I do agree with, with that. I think that maybe maybe a lot of the challenges for the artist is not having a precise enough creative problem that they're coming after. Right. Maybe we spend a lot of time with vision and with kind of mission but maybe it just remains too abstract. I mean, that there may be a real life, like, we struggle with strategy because, yes, we're in a qualitative discipline that deals with things that aren't, like, numerical. But at the same time, we can still be more specific, more specific than we are being. I don't know. What do you think on that? Dude, I'm, I don't know why I'm getting so excited in this conversation. It's so good. I, a practical example for, for me in that idea is 
Well, I think that's dead on. I think that a practical example for me has been diagnosing problems whenever you're mixing a song. So it's really easy to jump to like the solution mode where you're like, ooh, we need to, ah, you know what? I think we need to turn the bass up. And then, so I, I would maybe get that feedback and then just be like, oh, okay, we need to turn the bass up. I go turn the bass up, come back, listen to it. Hmm, still doesn't sound good. Or now I can't hear the vocals as well. Or it messed up this other thing. And, and then, or I played in my car speakers and it blows everything out. I've realized over time that often you have to ask more questions. Okay, so the bass isn't hitting. Tell me more. Like what, why? Why does that feel like it's, well, you know, like the vocals feel a little overpowering and like the, there's a lot of reverb. You know, you just start hearing other things in that, or even just like, I really want this to hit hard on this kind of sound system. Oh, okay, so you want this to like hit really hard. That's more of the, uh, the actual problem. Okay, why is it not? Then you can say, why is the song not quote unquote like hitting really hard? Is it, okay, what sound system are you using? Oh, does your sound system have the EQ adjusted a certain way? There's, you yeah. actually start noticing, oh, maybe there's so many complexities to mixing and you can easily just be like, you go, but for example, go back and listen to one of your songs one of your favorite songs, try to try to remember what it sounds like in your head and then play it after you do that. And you will not remember it properly. I guarantee you. You'll think that the snare is super loud and then you'll listen back and be like, wow, that's so quiet compared to the vocals. <laughs> but it sounds really loud in my head because perception, turning stuff up doesn't always make it feel louder. You know, that's like a very simplistic diagnosis of a situation. And so all that to say through, that's long-winded, but there's a, no, that's helpful. That's a very practical example I've seen in how to get better at mixing has been not always taking the first diagnosis as fact and just asking more questions and saying, what really is the problem? Because I can waste so much time trying to fix something that isn't really holding the song back, you know? Yeah, that's really good because even a precise fix could be bad strategy even though it's precise because it's fixing the wrong thing or it's trying to fix something that, that's too unwieldy. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's comes back to that idea of honestly appraising. But, yeah, I mean, you really do have to identify what's wrong before you can start to establish your strategy. And I think maybe that's that's harder than, than maybe we give it credit for. I mean, in some mm -hmm. instances, it's it, it seems clear. But I guess it, it probably wasn't easy to figure out what's wrong with Apple. Like you said, I mean, Wired had all these suggestions about what they should do, right? Because a lot of people thought they knew what was wrong, but you do have to kind of have some clarity on, okay, what are the main issues and how do we know what's wrong with our work as we're revising? I think that's where, <clears throat> I think that's where we return to taste, right? And maybe we can mm -hmm. recognize issues when they are seen through the eyes of a thousand other people who are doing it, right? I mean, this is kind of like the example we gave in our episode on taste about, okay, if you've only read one novel and you go to write a novel, like your point of reference is just one thing. Uh, but if you've got, you know, a couple hundred novels you've read and then you go to write a novel, well, then all of a sudden I think it makes it a lot easier to figure out what the problem is. Like, until those references kind of get established, and I think the example you gave was, you know, constantly moving back from, here's our track, here's the reference track. Like, we can figure out what's wrong with our track if we can identify what the reference track's doing. Like, it's it's in that tension with other things, I think that we get better at recognizing problems. I fully agree with that. References have been so powerful in music I don't totally know how that works in, in writing. I want to hear more about that, actually. But in music, having you always play your song, and then you play a professionally mastered song, and you're like, oh, man. And it will often just uncover challenges. Like, oh, I thought that their song had so much reverb. It sounded so ambient. And then you listen, and the vocals sound really dry. And it, it you realize, oh, the effect that I heard was not caused by the thing I thought. You know, and that's, that's cool. So it's like you... So I'd love to hear from you. Like, how does how does using references in in writing work? Is it really just reading and having a big, you know, network of ideas in your mind because you've read a bunch of novels? Is that kind of the whole process there, or is it actually jumping between I'm writing this post or this book or whatever, and then going 
and reading a little bit, going back and forth. Here's my kind of example in real time. So the very first sentence from McCarthy's new novel, The Passenger, is this. It had snowed lightly in the night, and her frozen hair was gold and crystalline, and her eyes were frozen cold and hard as stones. When you read something like that, you set up for yourself a metric, right? You're constantly learning, and this is what I love about writing, is that there's countless ways to write great sentences, but there's also countless ways to write bad sentences. And so every time you read something that's great, I think there's a little bit of a kind of residue that remains. You start recognizing then all these kind of different residues that start to build up over time. And then I think it's that kind of echo or the ghost of things that you've read that that internal editor that you have starts reading your stuff with that. So it's almost like, I, I think it's a better metaphor, it's almost like all the things that you read become the personality of the little editor that sits and after you write a sentence gives his judgment on what you've just written. And so I do think it's it's very much a process that's not super practical, although it, it can be. Let me write something that has this exact kind of, this number of syllables. Like if you're doing poetry, write something that's got, right, in the same um, meter as a poem that you enjoy, right? So that you're really practically doing what that the master's doing. But with other things, I think it's kind of this permeation of you start to develop a little editor that is the composite of all the things that you've read. (laughs) And so it's like you're creating a personality for this editor by the things that you read, and then that is becoming then what you read on your sentence. And so, yeah, I mean, I think it's very much the same as music. I just think that I, I don't know, in my mind, I conceptualize it as something that's not as direct because there's just so many different ways, and that's true for music too, I mean, you can be concerned about matching your snare with another person's snare. I mean, I can be concerned about matching a certain vocabulary with another vocabulary. But there's also that this hits. I mean, that's kind of ineffable, right? I mean, you know it when it happens. Right. And so it's like, I don't know. Sometimes we can get the practical things all right, but then there's still that something that may not be there and we can't quite pin that down. Uh, But I do think it's by kind of training ourselves with these references that we become better at identifying those problems. I don't know. That might have been way too esoteric, but that's at least kind of how I think about it. That makes makes a lot of sense. It really does go back to our episode on artistic taste and cultivating artistic taste. And it really comes through time and reps and experience and and then, so it really feels like there's two levels. There's level one, which is consuming really great stuff. And then that just kind of in the background makes you better at understanding this is the definition of good yeah. art. And then you have the zoomed in uh, level two, which is, okay, I've got this type of vocabulary. I'm going to write this type of way. This this poetic meter, I'm going to match this and compare or this snare yeah. sound, or this f- photographic style or illustration style, and really going back and forth in like the details of of the weight of a line, or and that can be hard, I think. Yeah. Right. I mean, I think it can be hard to. I mean, certainly my own. I mean, it's comforting that when I'm reading, I can say, "Oh, this is going on unconsciously," which I do think it is. But at the same time, like you can't just neglect practice and you can't neglect it's like okay well you got to learn what all those buttons do on a on a mixing board (laughs) like you actually have to have some really practical knowledge to be able to do the things that require you consciously learning right so i think there is conscious and unconscious learning and i think strategy falls into what can we consciously impose i really like that verb i think it's a good verb that the book uses um I think that is the domain that, okay, maybe we need this unconscious editor to help orient our strategy, but we have to have some sort of conscious strategy here 
because otherwise we're just listless, right? We're never, we have no direction. And so we're going all these different ways and we're, and we're, we're busy and we're scattered, right? You still need that conscious direction, but it's like you can't just have conscious direction because you have to kind of point it towards something. Mm. I think we just defined a couple new terms for the craft of vocabulary right there. Conscious and unconscious research or learning yeah. strategy. Yeah. That's, that's cool. really good. I don't know. Is there anything else that you were like, I didn't anticipate the conversation going this way. I think that it's it's really good, man. I think that we've covered at a high ground. The big takeaways for me are that diagnosing the problem is is the most critical first step. It, whether you're trying to figure out what's holding you back in making more money on this creative side project or how can I be a better writer? Like saying, well, okay, let's dig deeper. Let's really figure out what that means and what's holding me back. Diagnosing seems to be really critical, whatever the use case is. And then second, I think that it was just a lot of interesting stories and practical examples along with that. But This was helpful. Again, I think you said it well that we're kind of layering in some terms now. I mean, now we can kind of reference good and bad strategy in a way that's like recorded and we've got thoughts on it, but it becomes another way to, yeah, think about this. I mean, it, yeah, I don't know. I'm really pleased with <laughs> with kind of the exploration today. Yeah, I think this is like the scratching the surface on a deep topic. Yeah, totally. Like the rest of this book goes into all these like practical ways that you can implement strategy. And it's mostly geared towards a business audience. But there's so much more we could get into. I really do feel like there's a, a bit of like Dunning-Kruger effect, you know, where it feels easy to to understand the concept whenever you just have like a lack of knowledge. <laughs> yeah, so for that's me, good. strategy is like, oh, I get it now, but it's like scratching the surface of a super deep, deep topic. So I, hopefully we can come back to it in the future, but I think it's good to have as a topic we've talked about and a framework for yeah. strategy is a part of this overarching, what's your vision? Strategy is how you get to that vision. And uh, yeah, this was just a fun conversation. So Yeah, and I guess this is kind of nestled if we're thinking first principles, which is the last thing I'll say within revise, do you think? I think it's outside of these. I would say, I think it's outside because it applies to all four, honestly. Nice. That makes a lot of sense. Do we want to do a quote of the week? Okay, the quote of the week comes from good strategy, bad strategy, of course. And I thought this was just a great take to end things on. A hallmark of true expertise and insight is making a complex subject understandable. A hallmark of mediocrity and bad strategy is unnecessary complexity. A flurry of fluff masking an absence of substance. Love that. That gets to something I, I, I wanted to bring up and it, we didn't get around to it. Of like there's the emphasis on simplicity and like cohesion is really compelling. Like that was part of the job story of like we got to like simplicity is seemingly easy but it's not right it's actually really hard to condense and simplify but like that's part of good strategy i really like that i think it's compelling yeah i think it is too on that note i think we can wrap up today man but this was really fun hey thanks for listening to the craft with carter and colby where we share what we're learning about the creative process if you're a writer music producer marketer filmmaker photographer or you just love creativity then this show is for you our cover art was designed by Elizabeth Newell. You can learn more about her work at elizabethnewelldesign.com. That's Elizabeth, N-E-W-E-L-L, design.com. And you can follow her on Instagram at Elizabeth is a designer. If you like the show, there's three things you can do to help us out. First, subscribe so you learn when we post new episodes. Second, send the link to one of your friends who you think would enjoy the show. Uh, really, word of mouth is going to be the, the number one way we grow the show in any way. And three, if you have a topic you want us to cover or feedback about how we can improve the show or comments on what we've said, you can respond to heycraftpodcast at gmail.com, H-E-Y-C-R-A-F-T podcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time.